<clears throat> the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. People out there, people out there, let go of your cares, turn your cries into loud hallelujahs, this is what we came for, Ooh, leave all your worries behind, we know the future is burning bright, this is the great jubilation, this is what he came for, what he came for. These are the days, these are the days, these are the days we've been dreaming of. So don't look away, cause these are the days, these are the days, better get them while they come. We thought we'd never see the sun through the dark skies. But all the signs are saying it's looking up. These are the days, these are the days, these are the days we've been dreaming of. Open your eyes, open your ears, I'm telling you. is what we came for Ooh, sing in the song of paradise believe in the good news is alive this is the great jubilation this is what he came for what he came for these are the days these are the days these are the days we've been dreaming But all the signs are saying it's looking up. These are the days. These are the days. These are the days we've been dreaming of. Oh, yeah. If it's not good, then it's not over. 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 These are the days. These are the days. These are the days we've been dreaming of. So don't look away. Cause these are the days. These are the days. Better get them while they come. We thought we'd never see the sun through the dark skies but all the signs are saying it's looking up these are the days and these are the days these are the days we've been dreaming of oh, yeah. Dear God, we just want to thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for just waking us up this morning in our lives that you've blessed us with, Lord. There's many ways we fall short of your glory, and we just ask for your forgiveness. We ask for you just to purify and sanctify us, Lord. And thank you for uh, loving us in spite of us. Hear our silent confessions now. Oh. 
The peace of Christ be with you. Um, I have a few announcements. Um, Vacation Bible School is now open for registration. We're still getting the online um, registration situation uh, together, so just bear with us. But. Um, we're planning it for July 13th through the 19th, um, and the it will take place from 9 a.m. to 12 noon. So if you're interested, please register your child for uh, VBS for this year. We also have our pageant rehearsals every Tuesday at 5.30 here in the sanctuary. Um, it's important if your child is participating in the pageant to have them present, especially on Tuesdays. Um, because we are, what, like two weeks away, a little less. Um, the, the weeks are rapidly, uh, rapidly approaching. 
So please uh, be present if it's possible on Tuesday. And if your child is participating um, and they're unable to make it, please reach out to me so we can try to maybe make accommodations, go over lines, make sure that they're prepared, they get the script and everything like that. Um, we also have an ongoing um, brag, uh, brown bag lunch mission. So in any way you can read through the bulletin and see in ways that you can help as far as like buying the food and meal prepping or you know just making deliveries. Um, and also I know that Pastor is right now offering Spanish, beginner Spanish classes um, on Tuesdays at 6.30. So please register for that if you're interested. Um, and then also there are options for learning Chinese or learning Korean um, that he's opening up. So if you are interested in that, um, just let him know so that uh, he can put that class together. And I think that's about it for our announcements today. Do the edges first. How do you like to put puzzles together? Is there anything I can do to maybe make this easier for you? Hmm. No. Just gonna keep working on it. You look like you're doing pretty good. You know, maybe, maybe it would help here if I actually show you what the puzzle looks like. Do you think that would be helpful? Okay. There you go. So there is the puzzle. You see it? You think it'll be a little bit easier to put together when you can see things and where things go? Yeah. Wish you all could see this. They're doing a really good job here. So, you know, while you're talking, I'm going to talk to the adults too, because, you know, the church is like a puzzle. There's lots of different pieces, and, um, and eventually they all fit together. And certainly I think the kids could probably have figured out this entire puzzle by themselves if I just gave them enough time. And the reality is, is that we can figure out the church if we're given a, enough time, because we have all of the pieces that we need. God gives us all of the pieces that we need. But the reality is, is that sometimes um, we don't always know what the puzzle is going to look like. And so we use something called discernment. Does anybody here know what that word means, discernment? No, it's a big word, but it just simply means that we take time to listen to God. And when we listen to God, God begins to create a picture for us of what the church looks like and what the world looks like. And one of the images that God has given us is something called the kingdom of God. And what Jesus says to his disciples in this, uh, our scripture reading today is that we are to seek first the kingdom of God. And then all these other things will be added to us. You're coming along very well there. Looks like you all, you've got the whole top done. And then part of what, when and Jesus says that we are to seek first the kingdom, what Jesus is saying is to keep our eyes focused on the image. Just like you keep looking back at the box to see where all the pieces go. Jesus says, if we keep our eyes focused on the kingdom of God, then we can begin to understand where all the pieces fit together. And then we don't have to be anxious anymore. I see you've got the top and two sides now, almost. 
almost done. So while you're finishing it up, I'm just going to say a word of prayer. So if you out there will join me in prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day and for these children and for the gifts that they bring to this church and for the diligence and the hard work that they put in to bringing about your kingdom. Help them to keep their eyes focused on what you are creating and what you are doing in their midst. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, there you go. You've got all the, all the sides done. And a significant portion of it. You're, looks like you're almost done. And while you finish that up, I'm going to go on up here. This is what the church is all about. Each one of them is contributing, finding their piece and where it fits in the puzzle. And they are down to three pieces. One more piece. And you're done. Congratulations. Well done. We can leave it right there. That way everybody can see it after worship. And you can go back to your seats, or if they're going to Sunday school now, then you may go to Sunday school. Thank you all. There you go. First time to do that children's sermon. You never know how those are going to turn out. <laughs> but it turned out just right. You know, children ask a lot of great and funny questions that reveal both the complexity and the simplicity of faith. But before I do that, I'm actually going to read our scripture for today which comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 6. And this is verses 25 to 33. Hear the word of the Lord. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I also realized that it might be helpful if I just introduce myself. 
Some of you may not know who I am. Um, David has asked me to come in and to preach today. Uh, my name is Steve Houston, and I am the organizing co-leader for the Presbytery of Northeast New Jersey. Um, that's a, a big title, which just means that I oversee the 98 Presbyterian churches that are in Northeast New Jersey, from Bergen County and the New York, uh, New Jersey border um, down to Union County. Um, and so my responsibility is, is kind of like a call center um, when churches uh, need help um, or they just have questions that need to be answered. Uh, they can call me or call my co-leader, Jeremy, and we do our best to help guide people to uh, solutions. Now, back to my sermon. As I said, children ask a lot of uh, great and often funny questions that reveal both the complexity and the simplicity of our faith. For example, listen to these two simple letters that children wrote to God. Dear God, what does it mean you are a jealous God? I thought you had everything. Or, dear God, do you have a favorite religion? Here are three to choose from. Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian. P.S. I'm Presbyterian. <laughs> now what I love about these questions and so many like them is that children have an incredible sense of curiosity. Their questions are fueled by a desire to discover the world around them and as they explore the journey of discovery helps them dream of even greater possibility. Now, every congregation in our presbytery is thinking about its future right now. Some are doing it through formal mission studies as they search for new pastors, and others are simply talking about, talking about it informally at coffee hours or at lunch after church with friends. And this morning, I want to introduce you to a spiritual practice that can help you to discover and to dream about the future that God is inviting you to create. A future not focused on fixing what is broken, but is focused on discovering what is working. A future that shifts from trying to fix the church to a future that embraces the best of who we have been, who we are, and who we can become. Now, in the corporate world, this spiritual practice is called appreciative inquiry. And that name comes from the idea that to appreciate something is to recognize its full worth or to be grateful for it. And if you think about it, when something appreciates, it also means that its value has increased. And to inquire about something means to investigate or to look into it. So the spiritual practice of appreciative inquiry is about investigating the full worth or value of a church and its members and the larger community. That is, after all, what Jesus instructs us to do in verse 33 by seeking first that which is of the greatest value, the kingdom of God. Now, at the heart of this spiritual practice is a little bit of science. In the 1980s, Dr. David Cooper Ryder, who was a PhD student at the time in organizational behavior, he began to observe that many consultants who were interested in improving human systems often assumed that change follows a logical order or sequence. So in order to help organizations change, a consultant would first diagnose what was wrong with the system and then develop steps to make that organization, uh, help that organization make the necessary changes that they needed to do in order to restore its health and its vitality. And I've witnessed similar approaches taken by church consultants who promise five steps to grow your church or three things you can do this week to attract children and young families. But what Cooper Ryder and other scientists began to recognize was that the very process of studying a phenomenon or even studying a church actually changes the thing being studied, in effect creating a new reality in the process. 
Now, in the early 20s, the observer effect was used to describe what happened when you actually attempted to measure the temperature of water. And the idea being that if you are studying water and you insert a thermometer into a glass of water to determine the water's temperature, you will actually change the temperature of water when you introduce the thermometer. And thus, you change the very thing that you are studying. So in the same way, when a congregation sets aside time to discern who they are, to study what God is calling them to be and to do, the very act of setting aside time for discernment will change you. Thankfully, there is another way of stating this, and that is to say human systems become what they study. Or to paraphrase Jesus, what we seek is what we get, and more. So what does this spiritual practice look like? Well, like this sermon, it begins with some questions to help us discover what God has already done and is currently doing in our midst. Like the question Jesus asked, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Can any one of you, by worrying at a single hour to your life? These questions are in contrast to the questions which the people were asking. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? In other words, how will we satisfy our hunger and our thirst? How will we cover our nakedness? How will we deal with our deficiencies? You know, as I was reading through that, I could hear echoes of Adam and Eve in the garden in these questions. Before they were tempted by the serpent, they had more than enough to eat and drink, and they were not aware of their nakedness. But after they were tempted by the serpent, they became anxious about all that God had provided for them. And now, instead of seeing the abundance of God's good creation, they were only anxious about standing before God. Now, most of us are not worried about where our next meal is going to come from nor are we worried about having clean water to drink. And I imagine that rather than worrying about what we're going to wear, we tend to be more concerned about what brands we are wearing. But the reality is, is we are still anxious. And what I hear people saying around the church is, how can we afford to keep this building open with so few people? Or how do we recover the vibrant worship and Christian education we once had? Or how do we keep this church from closing? Too often in the church and in our lives, we look around us and the first questions we ask are, what's the problem and how can we fix it? And in all fairness, there is nothing wrong with this approach, especially when the church boiler goes out the week before Christmas Eve. There's no need to waste a lot of time and energy discerning God's future for the boiler. It's just time to call the plumber. But the problem is, is that we bring this same approach when we want to fix things like worship, or giving, or even mission. Our natural human tendency is to figure out the root of the problem and then develop a plan to fix it. But here's the trouble with that approach. When we focus on the problem, we end up focusing on our deficits, our deficiencies, our weaknesses. And if the problem is people not returning to worship after COVID, then we wonder what is it that we are doing wrong? Is our technology not good enough? Then let's upgrade it. And then we'll hire a young person to run it. Or maybe our service is too formal, so let's ask the pastor to lose the robe and dress more casually. The difficulty with constantly looking at our weaknesses or our deficits is that it can leave us focused on what we don't have, rather than focusing on the abundance which God provides. 
And this negative thinking also diminishes our capacity to create new visions of what God is calling us to be and to do, which in turn leaves us feeling hopeless. And it ultimately drains our energy and our enthusiasm. So rather than asking questions that focus on what's broken, we need to reframe our problem-solving questions into positive ones. And we do this because focusing on the positive can help us take an inventory on what is working and what we can then build on and develop. So in the example I was just giving you, reframing it into a question might go something, a positive question might go something like this. Instead of asking what needs to be done in order to get people back to worship, we might ask, how do we create a worship experience that is so dynamic that people can't stay home and miss it? Or instead of asking how we attract more families with kids in order to grow the church, we might ask, how do we become a church where people of all ages help each other grow in faith. Do you hear the difference? The big difference is that when we take a deficit-based approach to making change in the church, we tend to create negative images of the church and of ourselves and even of other people. And so we blame kids for being too distracted by their smartphones. We blame parents for not making church a priority. And we blame entire generations for the church's decline. But when we reframe our questions to be positive, then we can create positive images of who we feel called to be, and we can begin to see the positive contributions that each person can make. So here are a couple of practice questions to help you get started. First off, I want you to think back on your entire involvement with this congregation, or perhaps another congregation if you're new here. And I want you to recall a time when you felt most alive, most inspired, and most proud of being part of this community of faith. have a time in mind? Here's some follow-up questions for you. What was it about that experience that made it so powerful? And who else was present with you? What other details do you remember that made it such a dynamic experience? You know, for me, one of those experiences was in 1984, when I attended my very first Presbyterian Youth Triennium at Purdue University. And I sat in the main auditorium with 5,000 other youth from around the country. And I remember in that moment, and as I've thought back on that time, what was so dynamic about it what is it was really the first time in my life that I realized that there were other people out there like me other youth who were Presbyterians who had similar experiences similar faith as I had it was a incredible experience for me that has shaped my own ministry in my own work in the church. So what is that experience that you can remember? That time when you felt most alive and most inspired? Now the next question I'm going to ask you brings us into the next step of this spiritual practice. And that is dreaming. The questions I asked before are about discovering who we are, our strengths, the things that have inspired us in the past. And as we rediscover the positive and abundant things that God is doing 
in our lives and in this church, we be can begin to dream of new possibilities. We can dream about ways that God can use our experiences, our strengths, to move the church forward into the future in such a way that it will impact not only us, but the entire community. In order to dream, I want you to consider this question then. If it were possible, if it were impossible for you to fail, what would this church look like? Now, I know the temptation is to think about what the church looked like maybe 30 or 40 years ago when the choir loft was full along with the pews, and when Sunday school classrooms each had one grade level and were full, and when the offering plate was so full that reserve accounts had to be created. But that was a past that was built on past strengths. The future will be built on the strengths that you possess today and the strengths that you develop in the future. So if it were impossible for you to fail today, what would this church look like? Now, imagine that you wake up tomorrow and the internet is telling a story about your success. What is the headline and what is the story that is being told? Does anybody want to share a headline that comes to mind? Just shout it out. Pardon me? Meal Ministries. And maybe the headline is, No One Goes Hungry in Family. What's another headline that you can think of? Finding a place to be accepted. Everyone is welcome. Or a place where everyone feels welcome. Hmm. Those are just two images that you might have of this church. And I invite you to share what you uh, are thinking about as you go to coffee hour or in the days or weeks to come. And I want you to hold that image in your mind. Because like this puzzle that's on the floor, that image can guide you into the future as you can begin to figure out how all of the pieces fit together and what pieces you will need. And here's where we return to the idea at the heart of, a spiritual, of this spiritual practice, that we become what we study, that we find what we seek, which simply means that if we focus our attention on the image, of, that God, uh, the image that God has placed in our hearts and in our minds, then we can work together to bring about the change that must happen for it to become a reality. Here's another way to think about it. Some of you may be familiar with the acronym ROI, which is a financial metric used to evaluate the profitability of an investment related to its cost. We call it the return on investment. But what we study is about our ROA, our return on attention. Jesus says that when we are focused on what we will eat or what we will drink, our bodies and what we will put on them, he says that the return on our attention is anxiety about our life. I think there's a lot of things that we focus our attention on in the church that only bring anxiety. But if we focus our attention on the kingdom of God and on God's righteousness, the return on our attention is that all of these things will be provided and more. Here's a personal example of my return on attention. As a pastor, I, if I spent all of my continuing education learning, to, learning how to play modern worship music and how to utilize multimedia programs to create dynamic presentations, 
then there is a likelihood that I will develop a more energetic and participatory worship experience. But on the other hand, if I spend all of my continuing education studying traditional hymnody and modern liturgical movements and rituals, there is a strong likelihood that I will develop a more reflective atmosphere among those who participate in in worship. For what we choose to study is what we become. When we are laser focused on the positive outcomes that we want to create, we don't have to waste our time worrying about all the other stuff. Ultimately, when we shift our attention, we gain the ability to reach the goals we're aiming for and to become the very thing that we imagine. The very thing that God calls us or is calling us to be. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I preached at another church in our presbytery, and at the coffee hour after worship, I was talking to a member of their mission study team, and she was actually working on a puzzle that is part of their Lenten coffee, series, uh, coffee hours. So every Lent, they put out a puzzle at the beginning on Ash Wednesday, and during the course of Lent, uh, the community works together on putting the puzzle together. And as I looked at that puzzle, I said, you know, a mission study is like creating the image on the puzzle box. That the challenge is that people will come along and insist that you use the puzzle pieces that they bring. And the problem is that those pieces might belong to a different puzzle and are meant to create a different image. It may be a beautiful puzzle that they're working on, but it is not the puzzle that your church is working on. And in those situations, A mission study team has to say, thank you, but those pieces don't belong to our puzzle. And they won't help us create the image of our church that God is calling us to create. In order for us to get the greatest return on our attention, we must stay focused on the dream God has placed in the heart of this church. And friends, just as a child's curiosity leads them to new discoveries, our curiosity and focus can lead us to imagine and create a future that reflects God's abundant love and grace. And when you approach your faith with genuine curiosity, a lot of things can happen. You can open yourselves to a deeper level of understanding and connection. And most importantly, you can discover that the most meaningful answers often lie not at the end of a search, but at the beginning of a journey. A journey that starts with asking the right questions. I want to close with a paraphrase of this passage from Matthew. Listen up, my fellow believers. Don't let worry consume your thoughts about the church's future. What programs to run, what budgets to meet, or what buildings to repair. Life is about more than the strategies we devise or the structures we build. Consider consider the strategies of the birds in the air. They don't plant or harvest, and yet the Creator ensures they are fed. Aren't we, as a community of believers, as significant as them So make God's mission your mission, and everything you need will fall into place. Thanks be to God. Amen. I believe it is now time for our offering. And let us give thankfully for all that we have received, knowing that God will bless the gifts that we have to multiply the ministries of this community of faith and to bring joy and peace to the world.
be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come before you with humble hearts, recognizing your sovereignty and your love for all humanity. And so we lift up our voices in prayers of thanksgiving and intercession, knowing that you hear the cries of your people and that you are a God who answers prayer. And so we come before you this morning to give you thanks for the abundance that we have. And we give you thanks for the opportunity to share that abundance with one another and with this community. We ask that you bless these gifts that we have given, that they may be used and multiplied to serve people in need. And we pray for our world because you know, O oh God, that our world is filled with pain and suffering and division. We ask that your peace may reign in every corner of the earth, that you would bring comfort to those who are hurting, healing to those who are sick, and hope to those who are in despair. Guide the leaders of this church with wisdom and compassion, that they may govern with justice and righteousness. And we pray for those who are oppressed and marginalized, that they may experience your liberation and find justice in their lives. Help us to stand in solidarity with the marginalized and to work towards a world where all are treated with dignity and respect. And we lift up our families and our loved ones to you, asking that you would protect them from harm and danger and draw them closer to you each day. We ask that you would strengthen marriages and mend broken relationships and bring reconciliation where there is division. And we pray for your church, for your body here on earth. Empower us to become beacons of light, sharing your love and truth with all whom we encounter. Unite us in our diversity that we may be a reflection of your kingdom to the world. And Lord, we bring before you the needs of our own hearts. You know our struggles, our fears, and our desires. Grant us the faith to trust in your provision and the courage to follow wherever you lead. O oh God, we pray all of these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Amen. Please join me for our final hymn, number 400. And there is a fifth verse added, which you can find in your bulletin. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and always. Amen. Amen.